In the deepest reaches of Westminster Abbey stands an urn. If you didn't know what you were looking at, it may seem impressive, but you might not give it a second glance. The Latin inscription is long and hard to read, as the viewer is kept at a distance by tombs. Yet, this is one of the most intriguing items within a building of important and interesting tombs and items. This, that Latin inscription claims, is the mortal remains of Edward V and Richard Duke of York, better known as the Princes in the Tower, murdered, it asserts, by their uncle, King Richard III. So does this solve the mystery of the fate of the Princes in the Tower? These are the two sons of Edward IV, Edward V and Richard Duke of York, were 12 and 9 years old respectively when their father died unexpectedly in April 1483. Their uncle became King Richard III and the boys disappeared from view at some point in 1483. History has long considered them murdered, probably by their uncle. So does this urn in Westminster Abbey prove that they met a terrible end in 1483 at someone's hands? Let's see what it does and doesn't tell us. What do we know about this urn and its contents? Where did they come from? And how sure can we be that the human remains within the urn really do belong to and explain the fate of the princes in the tower? How true is that inscription? This is what it says. Here lie the relics of Edward V, King of England and Richard, Duke of York. These brothers, being confined in the Tower of London and there stifled with pillows, were privately and meanly buried by the order of their perfidious uncle, Richard the Usurper, whose bones, long inquired after and wished for, after 191 years in the rubbish of the stairs, those lately leading to the chapel of the White Tower, were, on the 17th day of July, 1674, by undoubted proofs discovered, being buried deep in that place. Charles II, a most compassionate prince, pitying their severe fate, ordered these unhappy princes to be laid amongst the monuments of their predecessors, 1678, in the 30th year of his reign. There's no equivocation in there. The remains are those of the princes, and Richard III murdered them. Case solved? Maybe, but maybe not. There's a little bit to be said about the context in which these remains were found in 1674. Context is always important in history and it's dangerous to ignore it. In 1674, Charles II had been back on the throne for 14 years after the experiment of the Commonwealth. He was asking Parliament for taxation for a war that they didn't want to fund. They were refusing his requests and urging him to make peace. As we'll see in a moment, the sources talk of the story of bones being found in the tower reaching the king and Charles ordering them collected up and proclaimed to be those of the princes. Why these remains? There's been dozens of sets of human remains found within the Tower of London or in the moat. Many of them have been proclaimed at the time to be those of the princes in the tower. Why has this one stuck? Well, partly it's because they're in a marble urn in Westminster Abbey. But why did Charles want it to stick? Why did he want the story told just then? History at this time was a branch of rhetoric. Stories were recounted to deliver political messages, warnings or lessons. I think the lesson Charles II was teaching here is clear to see. The 15th century is being used as a parallel to the 17th in order to issue a warning. An innocent king is cruelly murdered. For Edward V, read Charles I, the king's father who had been executed by Cromwell. What do you get following this? A monstrous tyrant. Richard III here conveniently plays the role of Cromwell. Then what? Then the kingdom needs a hero to save it from despair and destruction. In 1485, that was Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII and founded the Tudor dynasty. In 1660, it had been Charles II who had rescued the nation from tyranny. Is this how they repaid his heroism? By blocking his requests for taxation 
thwarting his policy. Look what happened the last time Parliament got out of line. Is that what you want to happen again? If not, learn your lesson and know your place. The bones in the tower were never about the missing Edward V and Richard, Duke of York. It was always about contemporary politics and using the past to get what Charles wanted now. Next, we can look at how and where they were found. The remains were discovered in 1674, near to the White Tower at the Tower of London. They were buried some 10 feet in the ground beneath a stone staircase. And bear in mind here that if we want to believe Thomas More's account, that requires a hole to be dug 10 feet deep under a stone staircase in the night and all put back without anyone noticing. And then Moore says a priest dug them up and moved them from that spot all by himself. So if you want to believe more, these aren't the remains of the princes in the tower anyway. There are several sources that refer to the discovery. Here they all are with the language and punctuation modernised for simplicity. John Gibbon, who was Blue Mantle Herald, wrote that on July the 17th, anno 1674, in digging some foundations in the tower, were discovered the bodies of Edward V and his brother, murdered in 1483. I myself handled the bones, especially the king's skull. The other, which was lesser, was broken in the digging. John Gibbon, Blue Mantle. The second account comes from John Knight, who was principal surgeon to King Charles II. He recorded, Anno 1674, in digging down a pair of stone stairs leading from the king's lodgings to the chapel in the White Tower, there were found bones of two striplings in, as it seemed, a wooden chest, which upon the presumptions that they were the bones of this king and his brother, Richard, Duke of York, were, by the command of King Charles II, put into a marble urn and deposited amongst the royal family in Henry VII's chapel in Westminster at my importunity. John Knight. A third anonymous account that gives Knight as his source records that in order to the rebuilding of the several offices in the tower and to clear the white tower from all contiguous buildings, digging down the stairs which led from the king's lodgings to the chapel in the tower, about 10 foot in the ground, were found the bones of two striplings in, as it seemed, a wooden chest, which upon survey were found proportionable to the ages of those two brothers, viz about 13 and 11 years, the skull of one being entire, the other broken, as were indeed many of the other bones. Also the chest by the violence of the labourers who cast the rubbish and them away together, wherefore they were caused to sift the rubbish and by that means preserved all the bones, the circumstances being often discoursed with Sir Thomas Chichley, Master of the Ordnance, by whose industry the new buildings were then in carrying on, and by whom this matter was reported to the King. The final account of the discovery that we have comes from another anonymous and undated source. This day, I, standing by the opening, saw working men dig out of the stairway in the White Tower the bones of those two princes who were foully murdered by Richard III. They were small bones of lads in their teens, and there were pieces of rag and velvet about them. Being fully recognised to be the bones of those two princes, they were carefully put aside in a stone coffin or coffer. Now this last source is problematic. It's the only one that mentions any velvet which might help to date the remains and establish their social rank. But it also states that they were immediately recognised as the remains of the princes and placed into a stone coffin, and that they were both in their teens. This is all in direct contradiction to the other sources who explain that the remains were thrown onto a rubbish heap and recovered later. It also describes the remains as those of two teenagers, not a 12 year old and a nine year old. As an undated account from an unknown source, it's hard to give it any weight. We then know that a year later, Charles II instructed Sir Christopher Wren, 
the man who redesigned swathes of London after the Great Fire to build an urn to house the remains. The Earl of Arlington issued a warrant that instructed, these are to signify His Majesty's pleasure that you provide a white marble coffin for the supposed bodies of the two princes lately found in the Tower of London, and that you cause the same to be interred in the Henry VII Chapel in such convenient place as the Dean of Westminster shall appoint. And this shall be your warrant, given under my hand this 18th day of February 1675. Arlington. The remains were found in July 1674. This urn was commissioned almost a year later in February 1675, and the remains weren't placed into it, the inscription tells us, until 1678, another three years later. This chain of custody might present problems with getting DNA to test the remains if that were ever to happen. They were dug up, thrown on a rubbish heap, damaged in the process, recovered later and then stored for years before being translated to the urn. Many people have handled the remains in that time. We can only hope that there's still some viable DNA available. The contents of the urn were examined once before in 1933. It's striking that this was at almost precisely the same moment that Mancini was being discovered and translated for the first time with a hostile slant. It speaks of the opinion of Richard III at the time that the urn was opened. The investigation was carried out by Lawrence Tanner, a historian who was keeper of the Abbey Muniments, and Professor William Wright, an anatomist and president of the Anatomical Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Their report is, like so much else, problematic. Of the 33 pages, it isn't until page 16 that we actually get to the examination of the remains. Before that comes a recitation of the history of the princes in the tower that claims to impartially relate dates and facts, but then relies almost entirely on Thomas More's account of the murders. This, I imagine, is because that account is the one that supports the remains being those of the princes, presuming always that you ignore the fact that More says the remains were moved from the tower. Almost as soon as the report begins discussing the examination of the remains, Tanner astonishingly states, Only the right half of the lower jaw of the younger child, whom I shall now presume to call Richard, was present, and that although both jaws of the elder child, Edward, were present in their entirety, they contained no teeth. No teeth might make it difficult if we were looking for viable DNA, but the real problem here is that at the beginning of what is supposed to be an objective scientific examination, Tanner has already reached his conclusion. He's already calling the remains Edward and Richard. That's a bit like naming a puppy that you're not planning to keep. The 1933 examination has been criticised in the decades that have followed. Technology at the time could not satisfactorily age the skeletons, and they couldn't be sexed properly either. There was no radiocarbon dating, so it isn't clear whether the remains are medieval, Anglo-Saxon, Roman, or even Iron Age. These could still be the remains of two or more Iron Age females. The presence of animal bones and dirt speak to the time that the remains spent on a rubbish heap, and missing bones to the potential of the looting of relics during the time between their discovery in 1674 and reinterment in 1678. The report ends with the question, can we assume that while the bones of Richard III have long since disappeared, trampled into common clay, those of the princes freed from all undignified associations rest secure in the company of those of their mighty ancestors at the very heart of the national shrine. The first part of that sentiment has been proved incorrect with the discovery of Richard III's mortal remains in 2012. I think the second part will be proven wrong too, and perhaps soon. So, in answer to the concluding question, 
I'd say no. We can't assume that these are the remains of the princes in the tower. 